Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with the Bulletproof Executive. Today, I'm really excited to have Karis and Matt on, who are authors of The Paleo Primer, one of the books to come out through Mark Sisson's new publishing company. And Mark is one of what I'd call the godfathers of paleo, and he's started publishing other books about paleo. It's morning for me, but it's actually evening for Karis and Matt because they're based in London. Karis and Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, Dave. Hey, thanks, thanks for having us on. Yeah, thanks for having us. I'm stoked because I like the idea that the paleo set of dietary principles is reaching across the pond kind of in both directions. So you hear less about it in, say, in London than you would in the U.S., but it's catching on. Your book in the U.S. is called The Paleo Primer. It's just launching, and you talk about kettlebell training and hormones and things like that, but why did you call it Fitter Food in the U.K. and The Paleo Primer in the U.S.? Like, What's the difference between the two sides of the Atlantic there? Uh, well, for us, um, we, 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 I suppose we wanted to be a little bit different for a start, but also um, the reason we didn't use the word paleo in the title of our book, which was probably a bad idea from a marketing point of view, but um, you hear so many different uh, trains of thought on what paleo actually is nowadays. You know, for some people, it's it's a very strict regime, and there's no dairy, there's no grains, there's no legumes. Whereas uh, some other people from like the paleo world might say that a bit of uh, unpasteurized dairy is okay. Um, so for us, you know, because we we do believe that dairy is an option for people. We obviously try and make sure that they can tolerate it first. And we have the odd legume here and there. Um, so we thought, you know, let's just not call it paleo. Let's just call it fitter food, which is the, the name of our company, and, and kind of like not run the risk of uh, upsetting too many people, you know. <laughs> and also, like from a, um, we wanted to sort of reach outside of the paleo sphere a little bit. And um, so fitter food is sort of implicit in that it's it's you know food that's going to be good for you, going to help with obviously fitness and um, and be nutritious. So um, it is actually sort of helping us in that sense over here, isn't it? Yeah. It's, uh, lots of people are buying the book in gyms and they don't really know about paleo, but obviously they do once they they read the book. It, it's kind of funny. Just the other day, I was thinking of going on the vegan watermelon version of the paleo diet. So yeah. What? <laughs> <You know? laughs> You, you sort of get this idea where it, paleo gets extended in different directions and all. And and that's one of the reasons that you know, with the Bulletproof Diet, I, I never identified it as a paleo diet uh, explicitly. Like it's definitely got a lot of commonality and I'm a huge fan of people going into the paleo direction. But there are lots of small tweaks you can make that have a big difference. And so it sounds like you guys are, are doing a service in getting this core set of principles like food quality matters and you shouldn't eat only raw vegetables, like, like getting that out into the public. I think it's doing a service to help that thinking get out there, whatever we want to call it. Uh, the reason I asked you to be on the show is that you also cover things like hormone optimization and kettlebells. It's a kind of a well-rounded book, but it's more for novices and it's packaged in such a way that you know it's, it's a primer. It's not for people who are you know going to argue for two hours as to you know how much palmitic acid versus you know some <laughs> other type of saturated fat is ideal for you. Because there are those people, and and I love them, and they're my people. But you know, for the rest of us, uh, what what's the what's the the very short version of of how you introduce a paleo in the paleo primer and as like for my grandmother like how would you put it how do you go about that yeah i think um i mean a lot of it for us was um based on working one to one with individual clients we're both personal trainers um and obviously we coach them through nutrition and training and so we started to notice sort of a common thread in that people um they were interested but not on our level um and they weren't going off and reading the books that we were suggesting perhaps because they were a little bit too um complex some of them and and there was sort of a bit of a gap for someone to just explain in quite an entertaining way. Um, I was doing a lot of the writing of the first half of the book about why it's important to follow these principles. And then Matt would read it, wouldn't you, and say, I'm bored, basically, I'm a bit bored now. So then we were like, okay, let's put some pictures, um, maybe cartoons, just to lighten up the argument a little bit. And, um, and then Rob... Rather being than sort of rather than telling people what they couldn't have and shouldn't have, it was about actually get excited about what you can have because these foods are really healthy. You just probably don't know it. 
Um, and that was the twist that we wanted to put on it. It's pretty much like a, a, a non-intimidating approach to, yeah. to clean eating. Because we find that a lot of the paleo books or even other kind of health books can, for some, especially kind of uh, average Joes on the street, could, could actually be quite intimidating, the thought of making such changes. And we wanted it to be less so that people could actually think, oh, actually, this doesn't sound too bad. I, I could probably do this. I could give this a go, you know. So, all right, so which of you came up with the idea of how to pimp your salad? <laughs> it was kind of both of us really wouldn't it yeah anything like that you're you're the, you're the title man he comes up with the titles um but i love my salads but to get matt to eat a salad it's got to have something on it like bacon avocado <laughs> like something bit of cheese yeah. to lighten up a bit yeah definitely. yeah you can always deep fry it that, that usually makes a salad pretty powerful <laughs> deep fried spinach yeah why not so so, so how do you pimp a salad like what are the recommendations you make to make a salad more paleo we just launched um, How to Pimp a Salad 2 um, in a little ebook as well over here. Oh, cool. We? Yeah. <laughs> that one's got everything on it. So we've got like roasted vegetables, bacon, jalapenos, uh, baked walnuts. Yeah, uh, ro roasted nuts are awesome in a salad. Yeah. We, we highly recommend that. But like Harry said, just um, some nice crispy bacon goes down well, doesn't it? Slow cooked, obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no temperature for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, three hours. <laughs> All right. Now you mentioned a couple of things there, where I'll, I'll ask you, uh, being you know some some of the paleo authors now, roasted nuts. Now nuts have omega six oils. When you roast omega six oils, they're less stable in heat. Why do you roast the nuts versus eat them raw or sprouted? We no, we actually do. Um, we do the um, we soak them and, and sort of bake them on a really really low heat in the oven, so we more dry them out. And we've actually put that in the book. Oh, cool. Um, but we do still get people posting on the page, I look, I've been roasting nuts, and we do try and go back and say, actually, that's probably not the best thing to do in terms of getting decent nutrition. Okay, so you're, you're aligned with that same general principle, because I, yeah, I yeah, absolutely. Like, there's a difference between like burning your nuts yeah. <laughs> and making them you know, nice. And it, it's a fine line, and depending yeah, on what does. fat you're looking at, like it's a small temperature range. So where you put your oven and how long they're in there is going to change you know, what happens. Uh, so yeah. you guys are, are into that and you tell people about it in the book, which is kind of cool. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, we've done it in, um, we're trying to do sort of videos on Facebook, getting people to like really lower the temperature of all their cooking and using slow cookers and steaming and um, putting up the studies that are showing it's, it's probably the best way to get the most nutrients and do the least damage as well. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Everyone's interested. <laughs> that's something that's been missing from the paleo yeah. conversation in uh especially in the last few years uh, this year I'm, I'm starting to see a shift uh and it's something that i cover in the better baby book and it, it kind of sucks because you know crispy bacon or you know a seared steak with a little bit of charring they taste amazing and mm. i can't tell you how many paleo sites have photos of them all over the place and you know if you're if you're eating for longevity and for maximum cognitive performance you've got to not do that on a regular basis because it it does show up. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I think the problem we, we have often is clients say that they get home starving and they're in a hurry. Um, and that's why we sort of try to encourage batch cooking, don't we? Get your slow cooker on in the morning before you leave for work and then it's done. You don't have to flash fry anything when you get home. But that's normally the feedback we get is, oh, but I'm, just, I'm really in a rush at night, aren't I? Yeah. I want to get my dinner done really quickly. What's your take on microwaves? We, we don't own one for a start yeah. <laughs> and we, we highly recommend that our clients use them as little as humanly possible. I mean, I mean, let's face it, there are some foods that just taste better hot, yeah. um, but you know, we do try and uh, prompt our clients to make dishes that they, they are happy to eat cold when they go to work or, or um, you know, they're out and about and just want a snack. Yeah, there's this really interesting uh, innovation. Um, it's called a thermos. And uh, I, <laughs> I use it for my kids. Like, oh, you wanted something hot? Here, it was hot in the morning. It'll be hot at lunch. And <laughs> here you go. And so I, I do that as well with some of my clients. Like, it, it's not that hard to make something hot that stays hot if that's what you wanted versus, yeah. you know, yeah. nuking something out of the company fridge. And it, it's not, not something that, that's a good idea. So I'm, I'm happy that you guys are, are down with that. And some paleo people are fine with microwaving and they think it's alarmist. And who knows? Maybe it is, but my own research tells me not. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're totally with you on that. I mean, we haven't owned a microwave for about three 
maybe four years? No, and what we do with clients is we just sort of list pros and cons and say, yeah, okay, it might help make things more sustainable, but ultimately you're sort of nuking all the nutrients out of the food. So, And most people cook in plastic as well, don't they, which is yeah. pretty lethal. So just explaining you know, what's, go- what's going on there is, it helps with clients. Yeah, there's so many changes people can make if, if they're sort of the average, uh, you know, the average person at home. They're just not, they're, they're making thousands of mistakes that are each one whittling away at performance. Yeah. Th- there's some differences, though, like major differences between Europe and the U.S. What about grass-fed meat? Uh, over here, we think it's easier to get grass-fed meat in Europe and certainly easier than it is in Asia where you have to import it from Australia mostly. So how easy it f- is it for you to get that in England? It's it, it's much easier than it used to be um, in the, you know, I mean, you, you'd be quite hard pushed to find it in a lot of our supermarkets. Uh, Waitrose do a lot of grass-fed meat now, don't they? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the general thinking is that most UK meat is grass-fed. However, what they're doing now is supplementing it with cereal. So it's sort of... 80% grass fed and then 20% cereal and we were actually out walking in the countryside the other day and there was um, we were walking through fields full of cows eating the grass and we thought you know this is marvelous and then we sort of stumbled across in the corner of a field a massive trough full of cereal so yeah. I don't really no one's declaring that so they can still label it grass fed because it is 80% but they're not labeling other than supermarkets will will say sort of part cereal part grass fed yeah. So it's actually harder than people are realizing now. But again, there is this movement towards, as Matt said, some supermarkets are starting to declare pasture-fed chickens, 100%. Mm. You know, so there is a movement and a demand for it here. But it's quite easy to get online. There's yeah. quite a few online companies okay. now that are sourcing yeah. grass-fed meat, which is, um, you know, you pay a little bit extra for it. But you know, if you're like us, we don't mind paying a bit extra for good quality. So. And people are slowly coming around to it, aren't they? Yeah. I think as well, like, I mean, we've, you know, we used to eat grain-fed steak, you know, like many years ago. And, but when you compare the difference in taste and texture between the two as well, so not only is it better for you, it tastes a hell of a lot better too. And my mum, she was, she used to be terrible. And even when we kind of converted to a kind of living, she was still buying really cheap cuts of, of meat and chicken and whatnot and she she didn't believe in paying you know a lot of money for it but um when we cooked her a dinner one night with a, a pasta fed chicken she just she was like this chicken's amazing where's it from you know, and we told her and, and that was it she was immediately converted yeah the, there's something uh, my wife is from sweden and you know, she spent time living in france and has uh, we have family uh, in england uh, in fact my family's uh, english historically uh, if you couldn't guess from the name Asprey, right? And uh, <laughs> so when I, I look at, at sort of the attitude towards food, I feel like World War II and the shortages there are still actively affecting society where people were, they starved when they were kids during World War II just for a couple of years, but it, it put this sort of poverty thinking around food where, oh my God, there might not be enough. So I have to economize and, I, and you know, I start pushing for for quantity instead of quality yet when you take someone who's used to eating low quality meat or low quality processed foods and you you give them the chicken like you did for your your mother all of a sudden like like you can see lights go on like they feel better that they really notice it and showing people that even if you take them over to your house just once to do that it can make a difference in changing demand for quality food and if we get to the point where people won't buy the crap meat at the store and it sits there and spoils because no one wants to eat it because they look at it and say that's not food Mm -hmm. that's when the producers are going to have to remove the cereal bin from the back of the the pasture land and just say you know Mm -hmm. people won't buy cows that eat crap so i guess i have to feed my cows the right stuff um that that's valid that's why I, I like having you on the show. That's why I like your book. That's that's why I do what I do too. Because we've got to change the attitude in order to change the supply, which is going to transform the ecology of the planet as well as our own bodies. Well, that's the thing. I mean, one one of the biggest issues we have is trying to get someone into the the frame of mind who would quite happily spend fifty quid a week on alcohol. Yet when you turn around and tell them you want to spend that they want you know you want them to spend an extra three quid on a grass fed steak, you know all of a sudden it's just completely out of the question. 
and we we want them to kind of make that association you know like why are you willing to throw your money down the drain on alcohol and you're not willing to kind of just spare a little bit extra dough for for good quality food you know it's it's not really a huge sacrifice to make uh, uh, most of the time it it's not and there's that whole notion of you can spend it now or you can give it to your doctor later. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, is that pack of blueberries or that stick of grass-fed butter that costs 20% more than the crap butter, uh, you know, is it is it really that much more? And when you look at the course of your life and you look at the effects on your health and well-being and on your pocketbook when you get chronic degenerative diseases, I think it's cheaper to eat the good food now. Yeah. Well, we, we actually done a, a price comparison um, with because uh, we're, we're on our fit of food page on Facebook, we're always talking about we've got a really good relationship with our butchers. You know, they're a really good bunch of guys. They they know exactly where their food's coming from. You know, they 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 know the the farmers personally, and that's the kind of butcher we want. And you know, they tell us everything we need to know. They can answer every question we fire at them. And um, I actually done a price comparison because we're always talking about our butchers. Everyone was like, oh, well, you know, it's far too expensive. Not everyone has got the, the money to just buy from the butchers. So I actually done a price comparison of the uh, the top end, so to speak, steak, sirloin steak that um, a supermarket was offering and their top end uh, chicken breasts as well. And in terms of the the price the sirloin steak for the exact same amount of weight was 17p more expensive from the butchers and it was a grass fed steak the chicken was uh, about 60p more expensive for the two breasts however um the two breasts from the butchers were actually they actually weighed more because they had, they still had the bone in and the skin on the other breasts were completely skinless no bones and they weren't pasture fed either and there was a 60p difference. So it's a lot of the time I think people just assume that a butcher's is more expensive. They, they don't actually bother doing their homework and checking the, the prices out. And I think they'd actually be quite surprised. That's the case in the UK anyway. So is there still like a local butcher culture there? You can go and, and is this just because you go to a specialty shop in London or does, do most no, neighborhoods it's, have? Yeah. It's pretty common here. It's wow. pretty common here. Most, most, um, most little... Um, what do you call it? It's not. Okay, I'm still always in London. Have them, and they've actually really benefited recently. I don't know if you guys saw the meat scandal um, over in the US, where um, it was discovered that in some ready meals over in the UK supermarkets that were like spaghetti bolognese or lasagna, they were analysed and found to have horse meat in them, um, which obviously is actually probably more healthier than some of the meat that should have been in there. Um, but yeah, and that actually put um, quite a lot of people off using supermarkets and they went back to butchers, oh, uh, went good. back to local butchers, which was a really good move. And, and our butcher said he'd, he'd sort of seen a big increase since that scandal. Um, people just stopped trusting the supermarkets, yeah. which is probably a good thing. We can hope that continues. Uh, I've yeah. seen some of the same things in the US. You go to San Francisco or Seattle or New York, uh, any of the big cities, you can find high-end specialty butchers who have grass-fed meat, but it's not that common. Most neighborhoods don't have it. And if you go to the average butcher shop, where they still have a butcher shop versus a supermarket, and you you say grass-fed, they're kind of like, well, like, yeah. like, like, well, I don't know. And and it's it's almost just a different world. So I I'm not I'm not. Actually, I'm more hopeful for England than I am for the U.S. this year that I'd be able to go get a grass-fed steak. But, I mean, you guys live there. I only visit. But the, there's one thing I notice when I visit we have to talk about. What's up with milk and tea? <laughs> it's <laughs> yep, milk, ugh, <laughs> tea, ugh, like, like it's not coffee. What's wrong with this? Is, is this like a revolutionary war sort of American Boston Tea Party thing? Like, like what's up with all that? Honestly, like I, I'm from Northern England, and basically, as, as soon as you stop breastfeeding, you're given strong tea with milk. That's what you're brought up on, and like it's just. And actually, when I work with clients, anyone that drinks tea with milk, it's like a battle to get that changed. Yeah. And I have to keep coming up with ridiculous. It's like a ritual, isn't it? Yeah, I have to keep coming up with various different. I'll try this alternative. Try this. Try this. Um, and game, we get people on white tea, don't we? As in white leaf tea, yeah. and they tend to find, oh, that's not too bad. That's almost like tea with milk. But 
Yeah, it's a, it's a national obsession. Yeah, <laughs> I have the same problem with my uh, clients from from London. It, it's like I have to have milk in my tea, and, and there's a good reason for it. It turns out, um, black tea is relatively high in oxalic acid, and it binds to calcium. So if you pour some milk in your tea, you're actually binding some of the toxins. Or you could just not drink the oxalic acid and switch to the beverage of powerful people, yeah, which would yeah, be yeah. Some, <laughs> vodka, right? No, uh, <laughs> it would, of course, be coffee, at least in my own biochemical analysis of the world. But you could also say that I have a biased view since I you know, started manufacturing my coffee. So uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I do find, though, that the milk and tea can be a big problem. And I'm guessing you do, too, with your clients. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's why we sort of it's like step changes with them. We would sometimes say like try um, milk alternatives first, then maybe just try some white tea. Um, yeah. And then we try and switch them on to coffee. <laughs> Do you really? <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, I mean, m- most, e- even though there's a big tea drinking culture here, there is also a big coffee drinking culture yeah. as well, well isn't it? London, London is very uh, coffee centric, mm. but outside of London in like Northern England, so it's much more tea when I mean I'm 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 a born and bred South East Londoner. I've always lived in South East London, and um, I'd always worked local to where I lived. I'd never actually worked in the city or central part of London, and I'd never actually drank coffee until about the age of um, till I was about twenty. I'd always just had tea and milk, um, and it wasn't until I actually started working in town um, and I started working really really early. And I, th- I suppose the natural way of life in, in, in central London is, oh, you know, let, let's meet for a coffee. Let's grab a yeah. coffee. And I was a bit like coffee. Like, what, what is this stuff? And it, I, as soon as I had my first coffee, that was it. I was, I was, I was hooked. Yeah. And, and now I hardly ever drink tea. It's, uh, it's one of those things where I, I enjoy tea. But, yeah, I tend to focus on coffee. Same thing on my, I think I was maybe 19. The only time I ever got an A in calculus uh, in college <laughs> was the semester I discovered espresso, and they made me take an early morning class. So I would have three espressos and go into class, and I had so much focus <laughs> that <laughs> I had good grades. How many do you have a day now? You know, I have a, a cup of coffee. This is kind of a leftover one. This is, I'm guessing, 14 ounces. Uh, I have that in the morning, and I'm good to go. Occasionally, I'll have another, like, two-thirds of this at lunch but most of the time just one as long as it's you know my beans because when i drink quote normal coffee I, I tend to get like i go up and then i crash and so i actually don't really drink other coffee uh unless maybe if it's some high-end specialty one but even then i find i just want a lot more of it um there are studies so what's, what's the time there now then what's the what what's the time there now oh uh, here it's eleven thirty in the morning okay wow so I had this at, I don't know, 8 a.m. And, you know, it's just sitting there empty. And I, I'll i totally be good to go. This had brain octane and grass-fed butter. And this morning I had collagen in it because uh, I I'm, I have, like, sore muscles because I worked out for the first time in two weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have another question. Something else. I, I like comparing how people do nutrition. I want to ask you specifically about a couple of recipes, but... Uh, beer. So if any country on the planet likes beer, I think it's like a, a war between maybe Australia and England as to yeah. who, who likes beer more. And since it's such a part of the national, I don't know, beverage obsession over there, what does gluten-free do when you try and introduce it in England? Uh, what do Londoners do about that? Are they drinking hard cider? Are they doing you know, wheat-free beer? What What's happening there? Well, we've... Um we we normally initially just get clients to avoid it altogether at yeah. first, yeah. Um, but there are there are some actually some decent gluten free beers here. There's a, there's one I can't remember the name of it, which we discovered not that long ago, which is made from rice, um, and it's actually pretty damn nice. Um, I was quite I was quite impressed. Um, so th- we we might recommend that to people if they're kind of entertaining at home and they want to have a couple of drinks but um we often try and push people towards 
spirits, don't we? Yeah, we just sort of say any, no more than two servings, really. Um, you're just doing yourself more harm than good. And it's just full of bad decisions after that anyway, isn't it? That's the yeah. thing with, with most clients. It's the knock-on effect, Yeah, it's it? the kebab on the way home and then, you know, the big sort of fry, fry up the next morning with fried bread to try and get over the hangover. So we, um, we sort of educate them and say, you know, wine, if you went biodynamic, maybe, and organic and sort of, uh, but even that, you know, I'm sure in, in, the, in the amounts they're going to want to drink it in, it's isn't, isn't not going to really have the sort yeah. of beneficial effect. So it's just sort of for us getting people to look at the amounts. Um, we tell people, you know, if you really are um, sort of wanting optimal health, it's an avoid or on the spectrum. Really. Um, and actually, people have really started to listen because, a lot, of, a lot of people find it affects their guts nowadays. They put a lot of stuff in alcohol that shouldn't really be in there anyway. But we've so. changed this, the yeast on the planet, and the species yeah. have changed. And it's funny, European ones are better. Uh, in, in Europe, you actually have uh, less of the genetically modified things. In yeah. the U.S., for like 40, 50 years, even before we did pure genetic engineering, we were evolving these hyper-aggressive yeasts that would ferment faster so we could make more bread in less amount of time or we could, yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I'm not yeah. sure you really want those like hyper-aggressive yeasts in your gut. And, and there are lots of people with gluten intolerance in the US, they go to Europe and they might, okay, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have a croissant, I'm in France or whatever, they eat it and they don't get the reaction they would get in the US yeah. and that's driven by yeast. And, and that's one of the reasons that I tell people, look, I don't care if it's a gluten-free beer, like beer is still like way on the wrong end of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so you're able to overcome that even in London. Um, that's pretty cool. Well, what, what, if if we can actually get someone to steer clear of beer for for a decent amount of time, or kind any of alcohol. Like, like, or any alcohol, yeah. yeah. Um, what we find is that they they have such a bad response when they do have some. <laughs> it actually yeah. makes them think, you know, maybe that wasn't such a good idea, you know, and. And that for us, like sometimes we're quite glad when people go off the routes because they feel so bad um, that it makes them think twice next time round, you know. Yeah. And, they, and they see like their, their skin and, uh, you know, their skin looks better without alcohol. They're, they get more out of their weekends. Um, and again, digestively, they're better off. They don't get the bloating. Mm -hmm. So it just it's a good all rounder, isn't it? Absolutely. But it's quite a hard, it is one of our hardest battles initially. Oh, good, yeah. It? Yeah, I, one of my good friends is a, a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, and he did a six-week no-alcohol thing, and he just loves his red wine, and uh, just confessed, yes, I I feel so much better when I don't drink. I have more energy all week long. It's so much better, and he's kind of loathing the idea of go, of drinking again, but he also wants to. So you, you see that, <laughs> that but yeah. you know, when they drink, it, it's going to knock them over. You can count on it. Well, let's talk about some recipes that most of us Americans don't know anything about. All right. Now, a scotch egg sounds to me like an egg and you pour scotch on it, right? Like maybe it's a hangover <laughs> cure. So I know that's not what it is. But what is a scotch egg and how the heck would you make it paleo? It's so funny because I knew you were going to say scotch egg. <laughs> Every podcast we've done, they've yeah, said, what the hell it. is a scotch egg? Um, quite simply, it's a, a soft boiled egg. Um, coated in traditionally it's um, I'll tell you how it's traditionally made which is the non-paleo way if you like so it's an egg coated in sausage meat um, which is then coated in breadcrumbs and deep fried so the breadcrumbs go crispy is there any scotch food that's not deep fried no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no I don't think there is <laughs> hence the health stuff um, so we just put a, um, and the scotch eggs are a bit of a family favorite of mine because my, my nan used to make them for us and my mum used to make them and I've always loved them. So we just put a healthy twist on it. Um, obviously the egg remains, obviously it's just from a pasture fed chickens, free range, organic. Um, we use, um, we get pork, uh, we get sausages from our butchers, which are gluten free. Uh, it's just almost 100% pork meat and herbs. Or we might use pork mince, but the sausage meat is just a little bit better. And we just coat that around the egg. And then we roll the meat in some uh, beated egg. And then just roll it in some ground almonds and a bit of seasoning. And then we bake them in the oven for about 25, 30 minutes. And <clears throat> they're absolutely delicious. That's, that sounds awesome, actually. So, so that's how to make <laughs> it the right way. And, uh, um, yeah, I had a very hard time. I spent some time in the Scottish Highlands, uh, you know, hiking and all. 
And man, like you can take a salad, it'll be deep fried when you get out of the main city. It's yeah. like Edinburgh. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. Like there's no, nothing to eat here, not even butter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is a bubble and squeak? <laughs> yeah, um, that's basically um, traditional sort of. Was it a Sunday Sunday morning thing after a no, um, it, it, Monday morning? Yeah, probably Monday. So basically, all your leftover veg from your Sunday roast, mm -hmm. and you put it in a pan with some butter, and basically just fry it up. And that's potatoes, parsnips, cabbage, everything. A, a, any, any, literally any vegetable you have you cooked have. on your Sunday roast just goes into bubble and squeak. It just gets mashed together and then fried, basically. Yeah, and that's from like the war, I think. I don't mm. know. I remember my nan making that for me. So that's ancient. So, so it's basically <laughs> lots of in in your case in your book you'd recommend. Health healthy fats like butter and all, uh, and yeah. a lot of vegetables uh, just sort of reheated in butter, sounds like. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good marketing for leftovers. I mean, my kids would eat bubble and squeak, and they probably wouldn't touch leftover vegetables, but all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, okay, liver is something that apparently, you know, in most of Europe, people eat it on purpose. My wife, like, loves liver. She would, I think, like, have a liver okay. facial if possible. Um, I, I just have never taught myself to eat liver. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to make it taste good. So in your book with the recipes you do, how do you torture the liver to get rid of that nasty taste it has? Well, um, <laughs> to be fair, um, we, we have a similar battle here, mate, with our clients. You know, most people are quite reluctant to eat liver. Um, I mean, one of the recipes in the book is the liver dippy eggs, um, just because egg yolks taste pretty awesome and it can disguise it somewhat. Um, we've we've tried disguising liver in a burger before, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, we did. So mincing uh, liver, up. Li liver up with lamb or beef and getting some herbs and spices in there to to, to disguise it is a good way. Or um, pate. Yeah, pate is fantastic, and there's so just, that recipe in the book, isn't it? Just blending it with butter and herbs and garlic and and. If you're not a fan of the taste, then more butter, more herbs, more <laughs> garlic. <laughs> I, I took some liver that my was this was young beef liver, grass fed cows, obviously. Um, and That's I, much I couldn't eat it. Like it just chewing it up. It it just I couldn't make <laughs> it go down. So I put it in the blender and I added some raw egg yolks and some herbs and spices and salt and vinegar and, and whatever else I could. And I figured that I could at least like chug it. Like I wouldn't have to chew it. <laughs> Right, like a like like you would treat a pint, right? It it still didn't work. Like I got half of it down, and I'm holding the blender up to my face, and there's like liver running down my face. And I'm like <laughs> it's just not worth it. I, I'm not gonna do this. Uh, so I started. I just freeze little chunks of raw liver, and I'll swallow them like pills, just with a glass of water, so I don't have to taste it because it's just not something. But in your case, you're hiding it as best you can. Cool. L lots of spices. All right. Th there's no magic. Like soak it in. Soak it in. You know unicorn juice or something nothing like that <laughs> no there, there's no miracle i'm afraid mate it's uh i mean one thing that we find that uh, we find that calves liver is better because it's it's much more tender uh whereas lamb liver can be a little bit more a, a bit tougher but we've i mean we, we we try and slow cook everything but we find with liver just cook it on a really low heat um just to keep it nice and tender because it's so lean you know if you cook it on a high heat it just goes tough as old boots and often what we'll do is just slice it up and pan fry it on a low heat in some coconut oil we get some paprika in there some uh, some cayenne chili salt and pepper and um we sometimes have it in like a similar to what you would have like for heaters like whether you use like an iceberg lettuce as a wrap and put the liver in there and then maybe top it with a a homemade salsa and eat it that way, which is is quite nice. Oh, there you go. You get enough jalapenos and cayenne. I guess you couldn't taste yeah, it. All right, good good strategy. <laughs> I like it. All right, so you get, we're going to get into a few details in the interview here, just because a lot of the people who are hearing this podcast, if it's their first one, they'll probably be like, why, why would you ever eat liver in the first place? And well, that's because liver has all sorts of vitamins and things you want in it. Um, but I kind of like it because you guys went a little further in in your book than some people. You wrote about peekapoo. And, and how you use beetroot for that. So what is peekapoo? What, why would someone want to do that? <laughs> um, <laughs> one thing we're really big on with clients and just trying to get the message to the general public is, is like support your gut and, and try and identify if, if things might be going a bit wrong. And um, 
So on our website, we've listed some um, little tests you can do. Um, Peekapoo is where you eat um, either beetroot or sweet corn, and then you um, basically just see when it comes out the other end. So that's just a bit of a transit time test. So okay. It, so it, it's a, a bowel transit time test. Yeah, uh, yeah. I do the same thing with my clients. We use the upgraded coconut charcoal. Uh, same thing. Like it's uh, dark okay. black. You know when it comes out. What do you learn from bowel transit time, though? Well, I got almost within minutes of that blog going up, um, I got an email saying it was seven days or something like someone Whoa. had done it. Yeah. So, um, it, like, what we're trying to do is just make people aware of the fact that, um, you know, bowel movements should happen every single day. Um, you know, to be healthy, you want to, we call it like, you want to take the trash out every day, basically. Um, and some people are struggling with things like constipation and just not understanding the implications of it, you know, sort of toxins and things being recycled back into the body um so i mean we, we're doing some things online with some um groups at the moment and we're, we're really sort of big on trying to get them to you know look at digestion and are they eating properly um do they need a bit of digestive support um are the bowels functioning is transit time optimal that sort of thing and um it's uh, for most people it's not and once you get that fixed you see massive changes don't you yeah. and, um just in terms of everything their training their um, health overall, you know, sort of skin, um, energy, just everything, isn't it? Yeah, so. we, we, we kind of like try and get people to understand that, um, you know, we, we, our focus is always the gut first. We always want to focus on digestion regardless of anybody's goal. We want to make sure that's in check. And things that we try and stress to people is that your, your body actually throws you a hell of a lot of signs on a day-to-day -day basis that your digestion isn't optimal. Yeah, I think what the problem is now is people just perceive them as, as normal. Yeah. You know, uh, farting a lot after a meal. Oh, everybody does it. You know, yeah. getting the runs every other day. Ah, it's normal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's trying <laughs> to change people's mindset yeah. to, to actually understand that these are signs that your body's giving you to say, hey, stop for a moment. Like some, something's up here and you need to sort it out. But people just think it's just, it normal. just happens to everybody. You know, it's the norm. It's definitely not the norm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it's kind of funny the number of people who rely on acid blockers and, and yeah. Pepto-Bismol and just all these over-the-counter drugs that are masking symptoms but not fixing the basic problem. So yeah, getting people to pay attention and, and just even feel the state of normal, I, I can tell you I didn't really know what the state of normal was because my my gut had never worked right since I was a little kid. Yeah. So you grow up thinking it's normal to, you know, be able to clear a room and just be glad no one blames you <laughs> um, <laughs> and things like that. And uh, once you get to just for a week or two where you're like, wow, things actually like are normal. This is kind of cool. Then you realize that there's something making that change. But uh, the link there seems to have been broken and a lot of people, we just aren't connected to how our actions impact us hours or even days later. So it, it, it's good that you guys are writing about that and I, I appreciate that. There's a question that I ask everyone who's, who's ever been on the show, except that one time when I forgot. And <laughs> it's one that I like to close the show with. It's, what are the top three things that you'd recommend, not just from your book, but just from everything you do with your clients, everything you do in your own life, the top three things you'd recommend uh, for making people more bulletproof, for helping them perform better at in all parts of life, not just food or anything else. Each of you, just go ahead, tell me the top three. You go first. They're probably gonna be the same, but yeah, you go first. Yeah, they're probably gonna be the same. <laughs> um, well, one thing we, we really stress to people is uh, to, to try and get some good quality sleep Oh, that was going to be mine. Oh, well, because <laughs> we, we, we always just stress that, you know, even if you're eating really, really well and try, if you're not getting enough sleep, it's, it's going to cause you some major problems. So I'd always say that regardless of what your goal is, just try and get yourself to bed early and get some solid night's sleep um, if you can. Uh, number two, we get people to just try and get outside, I'd say, as much as you possibly can. Get outside, see the world, go for a walk play with your kids, walk the dog, whatever it may be, go for a little run, just get as much uh, exposure to sunlight as you can. And number three, I'd just say just try not to try not to think about it too much. You know, just being healthy is actually pretty straightforward. You know, just 
eat clean most of the time, move as much as you can, get lots of sleep. And generally, people get really good results from just doing those three things, you know, without overcomplicating things. That would be me anyway. Uh, mine would probably be um, eat a nutrient-dense diet. So always looking, every, your plate should always just be packed with good stuff. Um, reduce stress as much as possible, especially living in, in London, God. Um, or any city. Even. Yeah, any city. And um, drink clean water. So, And no one ever does the water thing, do they? That's the last thing that people ever seem to get around to doing. It's not like people are drinking water out the river, though, is it? No, but ta London, <laughs> London tap water is pretty grim. So we do try and encourage people to get a decent water filter in their house. Um, and it's, it's a small investment when you actually yeah. say you can pay for it monthly, whatever. But Yeah, that last one, no one's ever said, you know, get a water filter. But yeah, that's pretty great <laughs> advice uh, from, from my perspective, especially if you look at how old the plumbing in London is. Yeah. <laughs> that alone is enough to say you ought to be filtering your house. So I, I like that one. That That's a new one. There you go. And would you guys please tell our listeners where they can learn more about you, the title of your book, if you'd repeat it, tell them where they can get it, and your URL for your blog. Well, uh, obviously, the U.S. version of the book is called the the Paleo Primer, uh, which can be purchased on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, I believe. Um, you may even be able to purchase it directly from Mark Sisson's website as well. Um, for more info about us, uh, best bet is to check out our Facebook page. So it's just Fitter Food um, on Facebook. It's the one that's got about uh, got about twelve thousand likes now, or something. Um, I say that because it's about three fit of foods. Now. Yeah, some other people have copied our name. <laughs> uh, but they haven't got as many likes as us, so that's fine. Um, or by all means, check out our website. Our website is actually fitterlondon.co.uk. Fitter London is the training side of our uh, of our business. and But all the fit of food stuff and all our recipes and nutrition blogs are, are all on that page. So definitely check that out if people are looking for some other inspiration that's outside of the book because all the recipes on our page and on our website are not in the book we we didn't want to just repeat ourselves so all the recipes on our page are, are completely different to what to what's in uh, in our book that's uh that's really cool i'm getting good recipes especially things like scotch eggs those are <laughs> not in any paleo book i've ever seen and it's a great it's a great way to, to prepare an egg it, it's really nice to wrap it in in meat like that that's awesome <laughs> It's, it's, it's a meal in itself, you know, like um, it's actually... It is the size that you make them. It's, it's like actually... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really one of our most popular dishes. Yeah. Like uh, people are forever tweeting us, you know, oh, look at my scotch eggs, you know, and we actually ran a competition for who could create uh, the best scotch egg. And the combination of flavours that were coming in were were pretty fantastic and... The, what, what did we go for in the end? It was something like lamb, mint, mozzarella, and, and spinach, but it tasted amazing. Yeah, which, yeah that's the winner. But, but yeah, it's, it's a very versatile dish, I'd say, wouldn't you? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show, for teaching us about scotch eggs and all the other cool stuff you're writing about. We'll have links to your Facebook page and your website and all that in the show notes here on the Bulletproof Executive. If you've enjoyed this show, everyone, please do me the favor of clicking like on iTunes or clicking like on Facebook for the Bulletproof Executive site as well. And join a quarter million other people who are hearing one of the Bulletproof podcasts this week. There was a time that I, I upped the uh, brain octane and, and, and did the three tablespoons. and I'm, like, I'm going for it. I'm telling you, man, I was like shaking and like feeling like I was going to have it out of body. <laughs> That's experience. a lot, man. Most, most people can't hack three tablespoons. I think I'm, I don't think I can hack it by myself, but yeah. I, I at so least start tried lower it. lower than that, everyone. If, if, okay. <laughs>